And we're back with Second Street talking about uh, one of the biggest issues in the country, and that is affordable housing, or rather the lack thereof. Uh, Scott, before the break, I, I mentioned sort of the the five ingredients that I that I see that go into people being able to uh, purchase homes. Uh, first of all, am I missing anything? But two, from those five, um, what do you see as sort of like the, the biggest bottlenecks? Biggest issue for our members right now is just picking up on what Chris said. It's around the municipal approvals process. If you think about uh, the nimbyism and, and the resistance against higher density, particularly in the, the ur- more urban areas, we're looking at 55, 56,000 appeals sitting in front of the Ontario Land Tribunal to the point the government had to intervene with legislation to remove uh, third-party appeals uh, just to be able to deal with that, uh, to be able to unbottle that. But the other thing I'd look at it would be the municipal side of things. Um, like you asked about what was different 30 years ago. 30 years ago, approvals for new houses was not as political. Uh, as it is now, and the pushback and the uh, processes that municipalities are adding on to uh, that whole uh, that whole process is just unbelievable. This is a government, a level of government in particular that's out there saying we need more housing that people can afford. We need to we have people that are you know pent up demand. We need to put them someplace so that these employers can uh, can hire them. And we look at them and say, you know, when when are we going to start talking about that 30 cents on every dollar that you're adding at that government level uh, to the cost of housing? So when you want to make it more affordable, uh, we need to start on both sides uh, of that discussion, not just uh, looking to the builder. Sorry, you said 30 cents on every dollar. That's the cost of sort of municipal So when you look at government fees, taxes at all levels, um, uh, that's about 30 cents on the dollar. And then when you look at that approvals process, I hear builders that tell me, you know, 20, 25 years ago, they could walk into a, a, their town office, walk out with a building permit the same day or the next day. Now they're looking at months. Um, so when you have a builder going for a site plan approval and they have their architect attach their regulated stamp on there saying this is, you know, approved, this meets all of the conditions and they're putting their reputation, their, uh, their, their license uh, on, on the line to do that. And then it goes to a municipality and you get somebody who's a non-architect, a non-engineer reviewing that process, adding five, six, nine months to that process only to say, yeah, that looks good. Well, with respect, uh, they're not qualified to say that. Wow. Okay. Chris, uh, Chris I want to get your take on that. Uh, you know, I mentioned the five ingredients, Scott, just yeah. his view on municipal barriers and you talked about that earlier, but what are your thoughts on, on the five? Yeah, I, I think municipal barriers, government approvals certainly is a big one. And also the easiest to resolve, right? Because if you have insufficient labor or insufficient capital, there's there's a lot of kind of tinkering you need to do to kind of solve for that. Uh, to upzone land, it's, it's really just like a political process that needs to take place. It's it's kind of crazy that we've ended up in this situation where, where there are these really obvious and relatively simple solutions available to us. Um, I will add to Scott's answer that um, one thing that we are seeing uh, a little bit more constrained than we might have a few years ago is capital. So it used to be that capital was abundant. It was flowing. Rates were low across the world. This was the, the zero interest rate period. Capital has become much more scarce now. And what governments did, both the federal and the provincial government, certainly here in Ontario, and I believe in BC as well, is when capital was abundant, when it was easy to raise money and pre-sell condos, they implemented these foreign buyers tax. And you could think of foreign buyers of condominiums almost as like equity financiers of, of housing. Is foreign direct investment that really benefits both people who buy these condos from these investors as secondary purchasers or people that rent these condos um, that might be owned by foreign buyers. I know there's a lot of kind of complicated politics around it, but what we've effectively done is taken one major source of financing for new home development and we've implemented new taxes provincially and federally. And now, you know, in Toronto, at least nobody could launch a sales center because nobody's buying any condos, which means this problem we see today of housing scarcity and unaffordability is going to look much worse. I think in two or three years. So what what's your uh, recommendation to the Ontario government as a, one example of the foreign buyers tax? I, I think we should remove the foreign buyers tax. I think we should understand that the way we get housing to be more affordable is for it to be more abundant. We need to build a lot more housing and foreign buyers help finance housing construction. So any policy should run through this lens of will this lead to there being more housing or less housing? And I think on that, on that basis, uh, we should not be taxing the people who finance new home development. Scott, so we only have a few seconds here, but what do you think? Do you agree with uh, Chris? Do we do we scrap the tax altogether? Should it be amended? 
Well, in theory, scrapping the tax would uh, incite some more uh, activity in that area. The question for me would be, for those that are investing in this housing, who do they plan on living in those houses? Because if it's more people coming in, it's not actually going to help the current demand issue that we've got. Okay. When we come back with more, we'll uh, continue to unpack this important issue.